Welcome back to Left Anchor. I'm Alexi the Greek. And I'm Ryan Cooper. I'm very excited today to have Dr. Adam Gaffney on the podcast. Uh, Adam is the the chief of physicians for a national healthcare uh, program. Is is that am I saying that correctly? Yep, uh, physicians for a national health program. Exactly. Yes, and uh, you know, long long time commentator, analyst um, about uh, healthcare policy, advocate of Medicare for all, and actual doctor. So you know, a little bit of legitimacy in that in that arena as well. So welcome to the podcast, Adam. Thank you both for having me. Really happy to be here. Um, just to kick things off, I thought that that I I first wanted to ask you about. Um, your perception of how the discourse around Medicare for all has changed in the last, like, shall we say, two years. Um, Because I remember writing about health policy in, like, 2015, when it seemed like Obamacare was going to be entrenched and we were going to have a sort of Germany or Netherlands-style system, and we are just going to have to sort of work with that and make it go. And... That appears to be not really the case so much anymore, maybe for you know a variety of reasons. But from from your per, your perch, so to speak, uh, how how would you say like things have have changed uh, since the twenty sixteen election and the Trump presidency? Yeah, I mean it's been an enormous shift, and I mean just to take a step back and even give a slightly longer framing, um, you know, I sure. got involved in sort of Medicare for all, single payer activism um, in, in, in a in, in in a more serious way. I don't know, maybe nine years ago, I would say I was in New York. I was a resident. Um, uh, up at Columbia. And um, I mean, at that stage, Medicare for all was really this highly radical concept. Uh, we knew that it was this incredibly long fight. Um, we felt that we were trying to lay the groundwork, both in terms of the discourse, in terms of the um, academic uh, profession, uh, in terms of doctors' opinions and so forth. But it really seemed like a very distant goal um, and, you know, without exaggerating, uh, there's been a complete shift in how people talk about it. Uh, certainly, um, you know, I think that the big uh, moment was the, 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 the Sanders um, presidential candidacy, um, which really put it back in center stage. Um, it was a sort of remarkable moment, as I'm sure you're both aware. And as that sort of campaign ended and as we got Trump, I was very worried that we were entering into uh, – well, we were entering into a dark age, <laughs> generally speaking. But I was worried <laughs> we were going to enter into a dark age from the perspective of healthcare too, that you know, at best it was going to be all rear guard actions. We were going to be pushing back against – um, you know, whatever sort of monstrous, ghoulish um, sort of reform package came out of the Republican Party. And that did happen. But I thought that was going to sort of take over everything. And it hasn't. At the same time that there was, you know, a pushback against this sort of um, uh, incredibly regressive Republican financing proposal, um, single payer has moved ahead and, and, and leaps and strides. And, you know, as, as you both know, is now pretty mainstream, um, at least um, in terms of what, where the political discourse is and where the sort of um, the discussion is among the presidential candidates in, in, in this Democratic primary. Yeah, it's, it's so mainstream now that uh, the public option, which wasn't even on the table during the discussions of Obamacare, is now the, the right wing conservative position in the Democratic primary. It is. And that's a direct result of you know, a, a single payer push that um, even establishment sort of think tanks like the Center for American Progress has had to really move left in terms of what it's putting out there. I mean, its proposal is uh, much to the left of the sort of public options that were being considered during the Obamacare debate. Um, it's still not what we need, but um, it does go to show how there has been a frame shift. And do you think that, I mean, because on the one hand we have this this like uh, advocacy f for Medicare for all that's been then pushing this idea for for many years. On the other hand, we've also seen the Obamacare approach has sort of collapsed both in political terms and in um, policy terms. Uh, like the the you know, they thought that it could be like Mitt Romney in Massachusetts is sort of conservative-ish compromising that would really stick in. But Republicans have been dead against 
uh, Obamacare much more than they're against uh, existing Medicare in point of fact. And at the same time, the Obamacare exchanges have proved to be like a real a real shit show, really just not working at all as advertised, sort of like a funhouse mirror Medicaid pseudo thing that, that really doesn't work for anybody who doesn't get lots of subsidies. Do you think that plays into it as well? Yeah, well, I think there's been two – there's been a few different dynamics simultaneously. I think you're right. I think first there has been – um, the policy failures of the Obamacare marketplaces, you know, the CBO had estimated that I think around double the number of people uh, would 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 take uh, part in these marketplaces than actually did. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting if you look back at the hopes and dreams of of these marketplaces when the law was passed. I mean, you know, there were proponents like Ezekiel Emanuel. Um, you know, who was involved in drafting the bill to some extent, um, who envisioned these marketplaces as sort of taking over the entire healthcare system and that employers would use them to, you know, um, uh, shuttle their their employees out of employer sponsored plans into marketplace plans. And it would become this whole neat new way of buying insurance and the competition among the insurers would drive down healthcare costs and would have all these benefits. Um, and that's a very old idea. It's basically what people call managed competition, um, competing private health insurance plans that work to sort of hold down dr- healthcare spending. Um, and that has been a, fa- a policy failure um, to such an extent, again, that, yeah, the, even the Center for American Progress's plan basically totally does away with them. So I agree with that. I think there also has been uh, a really interesting sort of moral and political shift uh, in terms of the way we even speak about health care reform. Um, if you go back, I mean, you know, I think that a lot went into the uh, to Obamacare and a lot of different you know minds and ideas were weaved in. But one thing that like one aspect of that moment in history, um, and this is true for the Romney care reform movement in Massachusetts, is how often people talked about um, the purpose of health care reform and expanding coverage. Um, a big point of it was supposed to be to reduce unnecessary hospital and ER use um you know if you go back to these like these quotes from romney where he's basically like you know these freeloaders who are uninsured i'm paraphrasing very roughly you know why you know shouldn't shouldn't they sort of have have to pay into the system and that's why we need a mandate uh, because they're just going to use the er in the hospital anyway um and you know i think obama didn't phrase it quite that way but that was a big part of it and that is like sort of like a a thing no one talks about anymore Uh, in part because it's been disproven it turns out uninsured people actually avoid the hospital. <laughs> they don't use it uh, gleefully. They just get a lot less health care of all forms. Um, but um, but there's also been a sort of political shift in, in the way we talk about things. And then finally, the cost, the, the idea that Americans needed more skin in the game, that was actually part of like the discussion um, around the time of Obamacare. And that was the whole idea behind the Cadillac tax, that basically insurance was too generous for many people, and that was driving up health care costs. Nobody's talking about that anymore. So I think there's been sort of a policy cha- um, a demonstration that was a failure of Obamacare, uh, particularly the marketplaces. Um, and then there's also been this more discursive shift that I think is much par- is, is part of a much broader progressive movement um, and, and, and a sort of frame shift in terms of uh, towards egalitarian politics um, on the left. Um, you know, where that goes is is not clear at this point. But, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, um, I just uh, – uh, I remember back in those days there there was this famous New Yorker article by Atul Gawande, Gawand, uh, another doctor who was involved in sort of, you know, public discourse, and it was all about – Fee for service. Now Americans are there's overutilization was the was the argument, um, but if you actually look at the number of say hospital discharges, consultations, hospital bed days, uh, all cause length of stay. In this uh, reading a, a a a paper on on this uh, from a a Greek Irene. Papa Nicholas, uh-huh. so I think a Greek person. Yeah, but anyway, so so the United States is down towards the bottom of of like rich countries. We're below the UK and Sweden um, in hospital discharges. We're below Australia and the UK in hospital bed days. You know, we're, it's just not the case that 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 people are are just like spending their days in the MRI machine because it's you know it's so so nice and pleasant in there. Yep. And, no, I mean. <laughs> That's a great point. 
I mean, the funny thing about this, the irony of this is that, first of all, me- Medicare for all proponents have been pointing this out forever. Um, I remember, you know, going uh, first time I heard about this, I, I heard I forgot who it was was speaking was like Americans don't use more health care than other people in other countries. That's not the reason why our health care spending is high. And the, the ironic thing is that basically every health policy reform idea that's come out of this sort of centrist um, academic health policy world has been towards reducing utilization in some way. You know, all these reforms, um, workplace wellness was supposed to, you know, make people healthier so they wouldn't use as much health care, so health care costs would come down. Um, you know, skin in the game, make people use less health care. Um, even, even universal coverage was defended as a way to get people to use less ER visits and hospitalizations because they'd get ambulatory care and that would prevent, you know, downstream consequences. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're 100 percent right. Um, there is now, in fact, recognition of that fact. Um, and it's really taken a long time, although, again, Medicare for all proponents were, were quite aware of it for a long time. Um, the question is how what the. You know the, 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 how the mainstream now grapples with this new fact and with this acceptance. What 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 are they going to sort of envision as the way to bring down costs now that there's agreement that it's not utilization? Well, this uh, I think this brings in the 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 uh, you know something I wanted to uh, think been thinking about for a while, which is what what is the cost? Because you look at you know. America has the most expensive healthcare system in the country and it's not even close. In the you world. Know, you, you, yeah, you look, sorry. Yeah. The world. Sorry. My, well, the nation. My yeah. Right. <laughs> also. <laughs> you look at a chart of OECD cost, like a percentage spent on healthcare of your, of your economy. And there's like a pretty smooth progression more or less. And then you get to the very right side of the graph and, uh, the United States is there, way up above the second place contender, which is Switzerland, I believe. And we're like five percentage points of GDP above Switzerland in terms of uh, spending on uh, a g- percentage of GDP spent on on healthcare, and that's like a trillion dollars. And so, like, what what would be if it's not overutilization in your view? What is the culprit there? So this is, you know, the the discussion that's happening now, and there's two ways to answer that question. So let me give the, the, the very simple answer is it's prices, right? So, you know, in a very simplistic way of thinking about things, the amount you spend on a good is the number of the, the quantity of the good times its price, right? It's just like that's just the, the yeah. definition. So, right, if our healthcare spending is high and our utilization is not high – then by definition, our prices are high. And that is borne out when you, you know, by various studies. So it's the prices. And that, you know, and there was this article um, a number of years back that um, Uva Reinhardt, who's this sort of famed um, healthcare economist who died two years ago, um, co-authored that was titled, it's, it's titled, It's the Prices Stupid. And it basically made this point. Although, you know, Uva Reinhardt himself acknowledged that th- that was not an original point. It had been made previously. Um, so that's kind of the answer we hear right now, which is, oh, it's the prices. And the problem with that answer is that it is true in a sense, but It leaves out the question of, well, what is wrapped into those prices and how can we take out the waste um, from it? How can we unravel that? Because at the end of the day, all of this money, say, that's going into a hospital budget. So a hospital, what it gets paid is the price. It's it's getting paid by the insurers and by patients, and it has a a certain amount of money at the end of the day. So what what is that money actually being spent on and how can we cut it out? Um, and that's what makes single payer, I think, a very unique uh, healthcare reform uh, versus something like all payer, which you know already exists in Maryland, um, and, and and how it's different because it would change really the way providers are paid, not just the amount. Well, and what's uh, hang on a second? What's all payer? Can you can you just explain yes. what that means? So all payer is basically the idea that all insurance companies pay the same amount um, to hospitals and doctors and providers. So you come up with a rate schedule um, similar to what it would be, a, you know, which is like single payer. Single payer, there would also be a rate schedule. Uh, but in single payer, it's the government. There's only one set of rates because there's only one payer. With all payer, there's still lots of payers, but they basically have to follow the menu prices that that the regulator sets. And that was a very popular idea back um, – 
and it, I think in the 70s and the 80s, several states actually instituted all payer programs, including New York. Um, didn't seem to work, and they sort of abandoned them. And the only one that sort of held on to their all payer system was Maryland, which still has an all payer system for hospitals. Can can we talk about Adam the the, the difference? Because you know when I talk about. Um... Medicare and these issues to my students, they get very confused very quickly just because they think there's no difference between, you know, the NHS and how Canada does like the difference between single payer. And they, they don't understand who pays who, who's delivering what, how's the government involved, what's the public private distinction. So, so maybe we could just back up a minute and just talk about a few fundamentals. Um, because why would we even want to say have the same rates but lots of different insurance companies instead of a single pair like what what are the options on offer and what are some of the main arguments for why you do it those different ways would you say sure so um let's see so the main options do you want sort of from international perspective or what's sort of like practically being proposed now by like u.s politicians uh, if you want to briefly talk about what's not even on the table, you, you can feel free to do that. Whatever was easier for you, whatever you'd like. I mean, the, the very classic typology of health systems um, is, which doesn't really hold up in the modern era, but the classic typology is national health service systems, and that's where healthcare is financed by the public, but it is also delivered by the public sector. And the sort of archetypal example of that would be the NHS. That being said, th there's ways in which the NHS does not quite meet that standard. Um, there is private care and GPs in Britain in some ways uh, operate as sort of private practitioners. Um, but that's that's sort of one model. So and that's similar to um, the models in some communist countries, um, certainly in Cuba. Um, and uh, and some Scandinavian countries, but there's a lot of differences between each country. So these typologies are very rough. Right, uh, right. The second classic type is what we used to call national health insurance, what is sometimes called single payer, what is now often referred to as Medicare for all, uh, what some people might refer to as sort of socialized social insurance. Um, basically, the idea here is that healthcare is financed by the public. By the taxpayer, same as in a in a NHS system, but um, care is is delivered by sort of a mix of private and public delivery, you know, providers. So it's not as though you're nationalizing the hospitals or making every physician a sort of employee, a sort of um, ci civil servant or an employee. It's more or less that the hospitals and the doctors um, charge the government for the services they provide. And so an archetypal example of that would be Canada. Um, but there are some there actually are some you know ways in which those systems can be more publicly controlled and maybe we'll I'll put that put that aside for the moment sure uh, and then i think there's there's everything else i mean there's a, var a variety of what get called bismarck type system um i'm sorry not uh, yes bismarck type systems which are um Social health insurance funds that are basically publicly financed, but it's not a single fund. There's different funds. But in many cases, like in France, that's basically single payer with a veneer of complexity um, and a sort of like superficial appearance of there being multiple funds. But effectively, they function in like single payer systems. And then I guess there's market based systems like ours. I don't really know if it has a name. It's just like a giant mess. Right. <laughs> right. It sucks. <laughs> in the classic typology of health systems, there is the <laughs> shitty system. <laughs> Which is a helpful typology because most of the Democrats proposing – um, the, even if they call it – if they attach Medicare for all or Medicare in the title um, – Almost all of them, except for uh, Bernie and, and Elizabeth Warren, are supporting some bullshit system where private insurance has a major role. Is that right? Bingo. Yep. I mean, that's it. So uh, even the various public option proposals would effectively give one more option for people to purchase uh, or buy into um, and leave in place the welter of private insurance companies. Um, and there's different versions of that that could that could have minimal benefit or might have some substantial benefit, uh, but not solve our problems, but at least help people. Um, the minimum sort of version of that would be 
you know, the Obamacare marketplaces have one more plan called the public plan, and ostensibly it would be less expensive because me- providers would be paid at Medicare rates, but it might very well be more expensive if sicker people wind up going on, it, relatively sicker people wind up getting that plan because, you know, insurance companies are really, really good and savvy at uh, avoiding sick patients as um uh, which they <laughs> currently continue to do, even if it, yes. even if it's illegal, um, and uh, <laughs> that's the sort of minimal version. The sort of maximal public option would be the Center for American Progress plan, which would in fact automatically enroll people who are uninsured into the public plan. So, so it it is sort of qualitatively different. Um, but in, but even in that case, that sort of public plan, put that in air quotes, because actually private health insurance companies could sell their own sort of private versions of the public plan, um, similar to what something called Medicare Advantage does today. And I'll just conclude by saying what Medicare Advantage is. So Medicare traditionally was basically a sort of single payer type system. Uh, you know, conservatives didn't like it, obviously, and they really wanted to sort of privatize it. So there were kind of some predecessors early for versions of this, but they didn't really take off because the financing was sort of tough. But in 2003, um, the Bush administration passed a law that basically created something called Medicare Advantage. Um, and this basically allows private health insurance companies to sell seniors Medicare plans. They're still financed by taxpayers. Um, and they've been very successful, uh, these companies, at taking more and more market share. So about a third of seniors are now enrolled in Medicare Advantage. So these public, the public option that's in the Center for American Progress's plan would be not a pure public option. It would be a public option with private health insurance companies selling the public option. That makes sense. <laughs> it's very complicated. Well, I, I love the combination of the convoluted with the less helpful, and that that's a great <laughs> – and efficient, you know, the, the neoliberals are always efficient, apparently, so. <laughs> yep. But it's still, you know, it's still, as I said earlier, it's still sort of, there has been a sort of shift across the board towards more progressive proposals that have no, been. I, I, yeah, I, th- I think that's a good point because th- those uh, advocacy based on efficiency doesn't really get any, get to anyone's heart. But also, it's it seems to be that the simple, morally right thing to do also happens to be the best thing prudentially. Uh, and and it's just watching the debates, you, you almost want to laugh at the the neoliberals who are I don't know if if they've just uh, drank the hegemonic ideology Kool Aid or if they're actually you know just catering to the donor class or what the deal is, but the, the hoops they try to jump through to justify why they're overcomplicating what should be a very simple thing. Uh, that has its nuance, of course, but but it's just kind of funny to see uh, the unnecessary complications, you know. And and so, uh, you, you know, you look. I, I'm a socialist, but I can see arguments that, for all its failings, capitalism and certain competitive environments lead to innovation. Although in your piece in Jacobin, uh, do we need Pfizer? Uh, you make a great point about big pharma and and how you know capitalism and markets don't always lead to innovation. Sometimes they actually just lead to more gouging and more you know exploitation. Uh, but put that aside for a moment. Even if sometimes innovation is a result of of market forces. What the fuck does that have to do with insurance, which is just a giant pool, like a risk pooling thing, right? Like the only way to innovate in risk pooling is to figure out new ways to screw people over. I mean, that's exactly right. And they've they've learned that. I mean, it's funny because I've heard that argument made like, well, we don't, you know, like, like what you lose out in the innovation. And I'm like, first of all, like what has Aetna ever – not to sort of repeat what you said, but what has Aetna ever in- innovated, right? Like are there scientists <laughs> at Aetna like trying to discover a cure for cancer? No. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they don't. And you're right. I mean most of the innovation takes the form of – I mean let's look at – just to be wonky for one more second. Look, let's look at the private Medicare Advantage plans compared to the r- traditional Medicare plans. What people try to talk about Medicare Advantage sort of plans as being innovative. They're not. The reason why seniors like them is because – the insurance companies, the, the, the sort of 
field has been tilted in their favor, so they're able to offer more benefits. Um, and second of all, the insurance companies create narrow networks of doctors and providers. So people can't go to the doctors they want to, and then they create hoops for people to lump, leap through um, in, to, to get the, to get like sort of care, you know, approved. So they get they, they, they all the kind of you know the prayer authorization stuff that everyone hates. And for people who aren't that sick, it it, it, it might be worth it. For people who are sick, it's not. So the, the less sick people migrate out of a Medicare Advantage into the traditional Medicare program, uh, making it look more expensive. So, so the, you know, th that's exactly an example of, like, what we mean when we say insurance innovation. Dodging yeah. sickness. Well, the, the, other, the other innovative thing about Medicare Advantage, if you, if you might call it that, is that they, they um, combine all the various aspects of Medicare into a single uh, – piece right they have there's part a part b and part C, uh, d that's prescription drugs and you know whatever is that's just a the consequence of how medicare was built over the years with like different bills being passed and that's innovative in the sense that like if you looked at it for two seconds you would be like oh yeah we should have these all in the same boat why do we have different uh, enrollment procedures for different thing parts of the same program that doesn't make any sense and it's just like like the this classic America stuff where you know you have all this legislative cruft built up over the years and it just doesn't get cleaned up for like 75 years you know but like yeah great job insurance companies but like that's the sort of thing if you could pass a bill you could fix it in two minutes you just have Medicare part there is only one Medicare part and you know end of discussion right which is how it would be under Medicare for all. And the same bill, by the way, created the Medicare drug benefit that created Medicare Advantage, the 2003, um, I forget what it was called, Medicare Modernization Act. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, George Bush, George W. Bush. That was George Our W. Bush. And that was a, it was a big giveaway to the pharmaceutical companies because rather than having it be a public drug benefit, they gave it to the private insurance companies to administer this, these, drug, these drug benefits. And as a consequence, Medicare is paying basically the same prices that private sector insurance is paying for drugs and uh, maybe a little less. But um, yeah, that's there you go. So I think it would be useful to separate out because there's the issue of what actually would help everyone or hurt everyone. What would help some people but harm others? And in this category, I'm, I'm saying, quote unquote, it harms rich people if they have to pay higher taxes, whatever. Uh, and then last but not least, what's a straight out lie? Because in, in politics, a lot of times you have a lot of flat out lies in order to, to win the political debates and appropriate terms like Medicare for all, even when that's not really what's on offer. Um, so, so, you know, maybe we can talk about, you know, those different categories in terms of policy, what's actually best for the common good. And, uh, then politically we can get to what's, what's possible. Cause then you get to the, the arguments. Sure. That might be better, but that's not feasible. And we can get to whether that's nonsense, uh, and after, but first maybe we can clarify what from your perspective really is best from, from best to worst in terms of proposals on offer. I think that Medicare for all, single payer, in the final analysis, will be is the only healthcare proposal that can bring us to universal coverage, eliminate financial barriers to care, and do so while containing overall healthcare spending. So I mm -hmm. think if that was your goal, if you want if you wanted to decommodify healthcare so that there was no so that people got healthcare based on means and not on based on needs and not means. Uh, which requires eliminating financial barriers to care, time of use, um, and you want it to cover everyone, then I think at the end of the day, Medicare for all is not just is not it's the best plan, which I think it is. I, I think it's the only one that can actually make that happen and make the math work. So, right, right. so that that is why I I I, I do support it, um, and and why I think we all should. Um, but I I can acknowledge the sort of pros and cons of other plans. I mean. You know, just just to imagine for a second, let's say someone said, well, why why can't we just do what Medicare for all does, get, make the benefits just as good in terms of what people get and have the private health insurance companies do it for us. And that way we can avoid confronting them, like which might for a second seem attractive, right? You might be like, well, yeah, they're bad. They're making money off of it and they're going to be playing games. But if at the end of the day, everyone gets the same benefits – then why, you know, is it the worst compromise to make? I mean, the answer is, is that it's not actually a viable pr program because 
doing that would basically give you all of the costs of Medicare for all without the cost savings. Um, and because of that, costs would rise and benefits would be cut. And that's the reason why every pr program that uh, proposal that's based on private health insurance never has as um, generous benefits as Medicare for all, because you can't really do it to make the to, and, and to make it work. Um, so I, I just want to mention that as sort of like an overarching sort of framework. Um, that being said, you know, what would the other sort of reform options do? So, you know, I think um, a program like Medicare Extra for All or Medicare for America. So what are those? Those are the sort of Center for America Progress sort of uh, proposal. It's basically a very large public option that would enroll, that would basically combine Medicaid, the Obamacare marketplaces into one big program and also enroll the uninsured. And that would have one very real benefit that I, that, that I give it credit for, which is that it would cover the uninsured. And that's big. Uh, what it wouldn't do is eliminate financial barriers to care. What it wouldn't do is achieve the efficiencies of single payer. Um, it, healthcare costs per capita would continue to rise. Even the economic analysis that CAP itself commissioned of its own plan shows that um, you know healthcare as a proportion of GDP would continue to rise under its program in the short term, even faster than it would if nothing happened, and in the longer term, slower, but still a continued rise. Once you get to the right of that, you have these – a variety, and I won't go through all of them because it's kind of boring, but yes. a variety of smaller public option plans that would cover some proportion of the uninsured that would be you, individuals could buy into it. Maybe um, employers could buy into it on behalf of their um, employees. And, you know, they would have a much they, – they wouldn't even – they wouldn't even have the benefit of, of actually covering everybody. So they're not even universal health care proposals. Can, can we get into what the normative arguments even are? Because I, you know, we'll get to their pragmatic arguments, which I think are bullshit too, that, well, this is the best we can get through Congress or something like that. But I think they actually try to make normative arguments, uh, about freedom or about, you know, at least you can keep your plan, which is ridiculous. But so what, what are the, the, the normative arguments that people that don't support single payer make? I mean, I think they sort of flail. I, mean, I don't know how consistent the Norman ar <laughs> arguments make. I mean, I, I think they read. It's like it's sort of like what's hot that week. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but I mean, what do we hear? Well, yes, we hear the idea of insurance choice. Um, that there's like a sort of inherent value in being able to have a choice uh, of plan. I, but frankly, that that argument I think is sort of gone by the wayside. Like you know, I think mo the the the. Ar the, the I think there's an awareness that that's actually not the case, that, that that people don't care about choice of insurer, they care about choice of provider, et cetera. So that was sort of like the, 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 the sort of soup of the day for a while. I don't hear it as much. Um, the one that like Biden you said recently and that you hear occasionally is this idea that you know, people fought hard for their kind of union sponsor, their union employer sponsored plans and <laughs> taking it away is somehow like anti-worker. <laughs> Which is – It's got to be the dumbest argument I've maybe ever heard. <laughs> and I think you know, there's probably some you know, right wing – sort of right sectors within labor that might reiterate it. But I agree. It doesn't, it doesn't make any – Well, but if you take away – because the thing that they bargained for means that that's one of the things that, that the capitalists had to concede, which means it's something that had to be bargained for and you use some of your bargaining chips for it. If you get that taken care of outside of the bargaining you're doing in that environment, then you have more chips to bargain with because you don't need to worry about it. It's taken care of. I mean, I totally agree. And everybody agrees that I mean, the general consensus among economists is that healthcare benefits are coming out of income anyway. So, you know, it's it seems pretty clear that um, that it doesn't have any sort of policy grounding. Uh, it does reinforce, though, the importance of keeping benefits in Medicare for all as good as they are. Um, once you start inter injecting copays or deductibles, even if they're small into Medicare right, right. for all, you really risk um, – it becoming slightly true that there may be some people whose coverage could get somewhat worse, right? So, so it is really it does behoove us to to maintain in these bills that maximum level of coverage, similar to what's in Canada or the NHS, um, in order to sort of prevent that from becoming a reality.
So that's a counter argument that the government could could switch. We could have Republicans in office, and they'll take away your one source of health insurance. Uh, how do you how do you combat that argument? Well, I think that the 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 argument against that is yes, a government could come in and do all sorts of terrible things. Um, but we know that systems that are popular, healthcare in particular, once established, become extremely resilient and immune to attack, particularly when a broad um, proportion of the of, 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 uh, the whole population takes part. Right. So Medicare has been around since the 1960s, and if anything, benefits have been added over time, not taken away. A lot of its deficiencies have remained, and that's a separate issue. But it has proven remarkably yeah, yeah. resilient, you know? I mean, the NHS, the funny thing with the NHS is like, or even in Canada, it, even the right-wing parties can't propose adding co-payments to, to anything. <laughs> because right, if right. they did, it would be yeah, too yeah. right-wing for them. I mean, that's fascinating. Whereas in the, le- in, in, in the U.S., like only the far <laughs> edge of the Democratic – left part of the Democratic Party can sort of be, be against – Copays and deductibles. But Adam, get 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 your government hands off my Medicare. Remember that the Tea Party uh, sign? That was a classic one. Yeah. So exactly. So that, I think that's the <laughs> argument against that. That if anything, public health care benefits that are for everyone um, are actually more resilient than private sector benefits, which can be taken away by your boss, so you can fire or all sorts of other things can happen. This actually happened in Australia, I believe. Um, where where the there was a conservative government they didn't like their their uh insurance program i want to say the 60s or the 70s which i think is called medicare um and so they tried to roll it back some it was horribly unpopular they lost the next election and the minute the the uh the lefties got back into office they immediately rescinded all of the cuts and and so from that point on it was like it's like the third rail of politics there it was like you can't can't steal the healthcare from from people. It's really yeah. You're, I mean, that's an interesting example that yeah, most people don't, aren't aware of. The 1970s. It was originally called Medibank, and then you're right. They sort of rolled it back, and then as soon as the labor got back into power, they they recreated it and called it Medicare. And Adam, do you think it's true? Because there's a lot of lefty proposals that uh, I support, and a lot of our listeners support that are universal. And, and you know, it's. Bernie's plan for canceling all student debt or, or whether it's, uh, the, any number of, of progressive ideas, um, often compete with the idea of means testing as, as, as kind of an alternative approach. And you get the moral argument if the mean testers is, well, why don't the, the rich just pay their, their own way for this? Why should the government fund something if you have a lot of money? Uh, what, what's a response when it comes to, because, and I think there's, there's several good responses, whatever you're, policy is. But what what do you think uh, when it comes to health care, the response should be to those kind of objections? I think two, 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 two responses. First off, and this is true for anything, if the rich are paying into the system with progressive taxes, they're not actually coming out ahead monetarily, at least. Right. So right, right. it's a totally fallacious argument. Um, and is a reason why Republicans always want to start by, you know, adding fees for Medicare for well-off people and that kind of thing. Uh, it's because they know that it's going to sort of undercut the sort of universal basis of the program. But but just just to reiterate it, if you fund the system through progressive taxation, there is no way that it can sort of be regressive economically. Um, the second thing, though, I think which is more distinct to healthcare is that, look, the point is to create – a universal system that's truly equitable in which, roughly speaking, a person can get the same quality of health care, the same level of health care, the same speed and and fanciness or whatever, um, whether they're rich or poor. I mean, that's the basis of it. Right. And I and and that has been a and, 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 and that's the sort of core political moral ethos. Um, and so if you want that. Uh, First off, you need a universal system that includes everyone, but also it actually is important to have people of all economic strata in the same system because it's a it's a bulwark against um, against the system being cut against um, the system being underfunded. Um, 
And that's a very real threat, you know. Uh, once, you know, well-off people stop using the service, then it's very easy for politicians to start underfunding it. And then the system might not be top quality. Right. And then people do want another option, you know. Yep, yep. And so you see this with us, you know, with sort of post uh, the austerity kind of um, uh, period in European uh, post Great Recession era kind of where, you know, there was this effort to cut funding at the same time privatized. They always go hand in hand. Um, and I think even in the UK, you know, the NHS, its proponents, its biggest supporters agree is underfunded. And you can't I can't be scientific about it or say it's totally causal. But I do think that the fact that there is has been this sort of um, uh, not huge, but substantial private sector and the NHS, outside the NHS, uh, where doctors, for instance, can sort of operate both in and out of the system, that existence, that private sector, I think, has has contributed maybe um, to the underfunding of the system because it's there isn't this sort of option to go outside of it. And I think in some ways, Canada has done a better job of avoiding that um, and keeping all of society into in one system, although there are efforts to undo that there, too. Oh, I was just hearing that, that the, the liberals in Canada, they want to create a uh, a drug be benefit on their Medicare system, which does not currently cover uh, drugs, I believe. And I think one um, one motivation there is that Ber Bernie is Bernie's proposing something, you know, and other people as well that that is considerably more generous than Canadian Medicare. And they're so they're like on the back foot all of a sudden, like, <laughs> oh, what if the U.S. does that's something it. that's even better <laughs> than than us? Like, we we can't be having that. I mean, look at these assholes. You know? we, we can't be in last, you know, in second place to them. Well, yeah. that's exactly what I was going to say, Ryan, because yeah, you know, and this is an important detail for people under Bernie's plan, right? So. The, the reason private insurance would be abolished is not that you technically have a law that it's abolished. It's that there can be no duplicative insurance. Like, so anything that's publicly covered is not allowed to be covered privately. And because he has so many things covered, dental, vision, et cetera, that leaves very little role that's even possible for the private industry, right? And, and to your point, Adam, if you reduce that by a lot, then the private sector is taking care of things for people that can afford it. And those people then don't care if the public option or the public um, pr you know, provisions aren't as high quality, right? Exactly. And that's exactly right. And that's why when people say, uh, well, look, why not, you know, why, why have this private insurance duplicative ban? Well, the reality is as soon as you don't, um, well, there's only two ways to really get rid of that. One is to cut benefits out of the public system if you want to give private insurance companies a big role. So if you want to say like, okay, we're not going to cover dental care, fine. There you go. There's a role for private insurance companies. That's that's terrible. We don't want that, right? Um, we want dental care to be covered. Um, and um, Or similarly, if you make this other tier, then it means that there's going to be a separate type of doctor who accepts this other you know, private option, um, uh, higher tier kind of private insurance, and then you're sort of degrading the equity, uh, equitable basis of the system. So I think that's exactly right. Um, the it, One interesting quick side note on the um, – and the Canadian pharmaceutical um, thing you were mentioning, Ryan, is that in some ways the debate over how to add the pharmaceutical benefit in Canada mirrors our healthcare reform debate. So sort of our allies and or people, progressive people in Canada want to basically create like a single payer type universal pharmaceutical system. Uh, and then sort of the set, more centrist voices want to create sort of everyone gets covered for, for drugs, but it's like through a sort of mishmash of, of private and public uh, payers. So it's, it's, it's sort of interesting in that way. <laughs> um, yeah. The, yeah. Well, you could hardly, you could hardly avoid being affected by the American pathology being that close, you know, it's sort of like uh, living next to the sort of plague house. Um, but I, I wanted to return to the, the question of, um, the pr the prices in American healthcare and and what to do with providers because you you have a sort of cohort of people I would say broadly speaking on the left you know folks like John Walker and David Dayen um, uh, and Matt Matt Stoller has made this point that uh, you know there there are a lot of providers out there and it's even it's hard to even say exactly how many probably a minority I would say. But but 
but uh, what you might call predatory providers or or providers maybe that that act in a predatory fashion in certain contexts and not in others. Um, you know, so you have folks where it's like the ER doctors or the anesthesiologists or the radiologists are out of network from the rest of the hospital. And so the hospital may be in your network, but if you're, you know, bleeding out from a car accident and you go to this hospital, even if the hospital is in your network, the doctor is going to charge you up to your back teeth for, because they're not in your network. And so, I don't know, just, you, you've, you said some stuff on like, like, providers in general like like what is your view on what needs to happen with with how providers are paid and how much they are paid under a medicare system yeah so this is becoming um a sort of new debate um and i'm sure you've seen me arguing about it with with john walker <laughs> yeah, yeah. in particular on twitter um and it gets a little bit, it gets a little heated sometimes. And I, so I, I think there's a few different aspects to this discussion. Number one, is there grotesque behaviors? And the answer is yes, unquestionably. Uh, I mean, what was the news story about, you know, the nonprofit hospital recently that was like just routinely suing all of its patients? Uh, I think it was reported in Kaiser Health News. There was something Ooh. about, um, John, um, anyway, th there's all sorts of things like that. There's out of network problems, people getting giant bills. Yeah, it's horrible. It's terrible. And there's a very easy way to fix it. A single buyer system without networks, it would dissolve completely instantaneously and never be a problem again. It would be illegal. In fact, under like the single payer bills as written, if a doctor uh, billed Medicare for all for anything, she could not bill a patient for any Medicare cover, uh, Medicare for all covered um, service within, I think, like two years or something like that. So it has extremely strict prohibitions that would basically end out of, I mean, there wouldn't be networks anyway, but really any, it would more or less make it impossible for patients to get a bill from anybody unless it was for an explicitly uncovered item like cosmetic surgery. So that's one right. aspect of the story, and I and I would hope we I think we're all in agreement that 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 is a problem. The question is, how do you change that? And the, the answer is quite simple: you change the financing system, right? I mean, we all think that this sort of bad apples argument rarely explains anything. You have to change the system if you want to make sure that 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 you eradicate bad behaviors. So, uh, to me, I, I you know. I never understand. I don't understand where they're coming from with like, why aren't they talking about providers when we are proposing a piece of legislation that would actually make any sort of behavior of that sort illegal? I, so that that would be the first thing. The second question is how much, which I, and I've written your, I've read your piece on the, on this question, which is sort of how much savings could we achieve by reducing payments to the to the providers in order to reduce US healthcare spending in the short term? And that's a, a different and more complicated question. Yes, because because you, you've read Ryan's piece yeah. and I've read your piece, and I believe that you make a very good point in your piece, Adam, about um, the current state that we're in shifting to, say, the fact that Canada has one-tenth the cost of insulin or, or any number of cost savings in different systems uh, we can't just immediately get to that um, that system, right? We're not actually starting from zero. And as much as I criticize Obama for any number of things, uh, and I don't believe that it was good that he didn't fight for a, a more leftist healthcare um, system, he had some point, didn't he, when he said, look, if I was starting from scratch, I remember this very clearly. He said, if we were starting from scratch, I would do single payer. But since we're not, I'm going to propose this convoluted nonsense, but uh, th it isn't so simple, right? To, to get to the, the prices that Canada pays for services from where we are today. Is that, is that part of what your argument is? So there might be cost savings, but you're not just going to immediately cut them in half or something. Right. So I think with drugs, you actually can cut them in half pretty quickly because, you know, there, there is a lot forward. of fat. There's 20 yeah. percent profits in the pharmaceutical industry. And ultimately, the prices are, are just sort of a, a, a manifestation of patents. Right. That's just a product. That's just a product being sold a lot simpler. Uh, services are a little more complicated. So there's a few ways to look at this. So first, what happened? Why is, you know, we spent our healthcare system system costs twice as much as those of other countries. And how did that develop? So that developed over several decades, 
which is important to keep in mind. The systems that existed in these countries, all these other countries, these universal systems, when they were implemented, none of them, as far as I'm aware, made healthcare spending fall. In the short term, giving everybody in the health in the economy, everyone in the society, health, access to all healthcare services and eliminating financial barriers to care. That can be done without increasing healthcare spending. As far as I'm aware, in the course of human history, there's never been a nation that's implemented universal healthcare and then suddenly started spending half as much on healthcare. You know what I mean? It would be like saying if we implemented universal free college for every college, but would we as a society immediately spend less on college? And I think that's unlikely, even if there are big savings to be wrung out. If we abolished, if we abolished college football, maybe that would do it. <laughs> but it's going to be okay. Right. There you go. Okay. So that's, that's the second thing, the historical perspective question. The third issue is um, – what was the third issue? Oh, so the third issue is um, that there is going to be some new costs too. So right? So whatever, there's a big argument about how much utilization would increase under Medicare for all. Now, people on the left used to say something like, well, people don't go to, go to the doctor because they want to – there shouldn't be an increase in utilization, but there actually will be because people are, are – the flip side of that coin is people are avoiding um, the doctor, avoiding the ER, not taking drugs, not getting therapy, et cetera, uh, because they can't afford it because the copays are too high or they're uninsured. So there will be an increase in costs um, you know, in terms of increased utilization, and there's a big debate by how much will that be. Would it be 5 percent? Would it be 10 percent? Um, and – I actually believe it will be more modest for services than other than other people think because I think there's a degree of supply limitation. That's a separate argument. But either way, there's going to be some new costs. So you have to also figure that any savings you ring will be to some extent offset by by costs, okay, by the new cost, the new utilization. Um, but at the end of the day, so so I do think there are efficiencies. I think if you take something like a hospital, right? A hospital has a budget. Um, you can, in fact take away its profits. You can get rid of hospital profits. But to do that, you need a real deep reform in the way we finance hospitals. And, and hospital mar operating margins might only be 3 or 4 or 5%, right? So even if you get rid of that, that's still a relatively small proportion of total, total overall ho hospital spending. Now, right, if you right. go beyond that and just slash the hospital's budget in half, what, what would the hospital – how would a typical profit-oriented hospital react? It would lay off nurses. It would go to war with its workers. It might discontinue its unprofitable services. It would probably focus more on more profitable services. It would be a mess, and it's not going to happen. You know, hospital budgets aren't going to suddenly – fall in half, you know, even if you reduce salaries for the high powered executives and, and so on and so forth. So I do think there are savings. I think you can look at a hospital. You can definitely get rid of their large parts of their billing departments and administration. That might bring down hospital costs by 10 percent. You can remove the profits. But then if you remove profits, you need a separate way to fund hospital capital expansion. So some of that will be offset. Um, there are savings, but you're also going to expect that hospitals are going to provide more care because there will be more insurance, more people insured. Um, so I just want to make sure we don't promise things that we can't deliver. Um, the final question in this all is, OK, fine. So maybe hospital budgets can only sh shrink by X amount uh, without you know, causing a whole you know, the, the, the disruption in services provided. Um, well, how about doctors? Can we cut doctor salaries? And I'm totally sympathetic to the argument, given that we live in this country with incredible – doctors are very well paid, and we live in this society with extremely high um, – um, um, you know, inequality. So isn't that a way to sort of reduce inequality? Um, and whatever you feel about it, um, there's not that much, it's not enough savings that can be achieved that way that would make a dent in the taxes we have to raise. That's not where the money is, right? About, about eight to 10% of our healthcare spending is in physician salaries. So yeah. if you went to war on doctors and give every doctor in America a 25% haircut off their pay, and if you didn't increase the number of doctors, and if you did that somehow without um, having doctors work outside the system, that would be a 25% reduction in spending on physician salaries or a roughly 2% reduction in our healthcare spending. So for a 2% reduction, this is a point Obi Reinhardt once made, for a 2% reduction in our healthcare spending, you'd basically foreclose on any possibility of doctors getting 
behind this reform, um, you know, and that would I, I don't think it's worth it. So. So, now, yeah, this is good, Adam. This is good because now we're getting into political feasibility and possibility and who you want to go to war with. So what you're saying is go to war with Big Pharma. There's actually a good amount of money to be gained in, in all of the gouging that they're doing with their profits. Uh, go to war with the private insurance industry because they're not doing anything of value. They're just harming people. Um, and because and I, I have a friend right now who's organizing nurses to unionize, right? And I think it's important to think about how this works together with um, things like taking on big pharma and things like unionizing nurses and, and making sure workers are getting paid well. Um, so, so I don't know. Do you have any more to, to add on? on I think because that seems to be kind of what you're saying is, is pick your battles and think who's on your side and really who the, the kind of the enemy is in a way in this in this current system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. We we want to bring out the better better angels of the of better nature of angels or whatever of healthcare providers. We want hospitals to become social institutions, not businesses. We want to change them, but we need hospitals in the system. We need doctors in the system. We need nurses in the system. So we don't need private insurers. In fact, we explicitly need them to go away if we're going to achieve the kind of healthcare system that we that we need in this country. So yeah, I think that's I think that's about right. And it might, you know, I'm a physician and I work at a hospital, so it might you might say, well, isn't that convenient? But I really <laughs> think that um I, I, I really think that that is the road to success. And it doesn't mean that the physicians you know we should call out groups that are that are opposed. You know, my, my group and NNU and other groups organized a big protest outside the AMA's national convention to call them out for, for opposing Medicare for all. Um, Nina Turner was there as well. We should call people out or call lobbying organizations out. Um, but, you know, things can change. And at that at that very moment, um, you know, some of the younger people in the AMA proposed a, a resolution to – Take you know, to basically rescind AMA's longstanding opposition to single payer, and it didn't win, but it came pretty close. And that's a that's that's a big that's big news, you know. And so yeah, I think you know when who knows where the how lobbying organizations are gonna are gonna fall, but in the but overall, um, we do need providers, we do need hospitals, we don't need insurance companies, and I think that is that that that's my case, and I don't know if it if it's persuasive, but uh, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I that's I was just going to bring that up actually that that um you do you do have a whole bunch of provider groups that are on board with the uh, what's it called Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, which is just basically dead against Medicare not just Medicare for all, basically anything. They're even against a Biden's um healthcare reform. And you got the AMA in there, you got the American College of Radiology, Federation of American Hospitals, um, you know, probably a, probably a 10 more just scrolling through this, uh, uh, diagram of, 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 uh, logos here of organizations I've never heard of. Um, and those, you know, those are providers against, you know, extending, I, f you know, feel like they, they, uh, are making a good thing out of what the of the current system, and they don't want it to change. Yeah, um, they should be they should be called out. I mean, that's what that's what we did. We we you know protested in front of AMA's uh, national convention. They, and in my opinion, they do not represent the views of the American medical profession because if you look at the polls, aren't great, but the polls we do have suggest that um, you know maybe even a majority of physicians um, would support Medicare for all. So you know, but I think that. Um, so I think they should be called out. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and the, maybe the other piece of it is that, you know, it's again, it's it's impossible to tell, you know, because the the pricing on, on what, you know, these these providers are charging for things is so opaque. Like there's like I've tried to look up charge master data on things and it varies so much between different um, providers. But it does seem like there is a minority of 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 providers that are that are really just run by sociopaths like there there's a study on on hospitals where the they they were charging uninsured patients 10 times the cost of care and you could imagine if if everybody you know th this was was like 50 something hospitals you could imagine if the if these uh uh if if there's a 
uh, Medicare program and suddenly ev- all the uninsured people are on Medicare and you're having to take Medicare prices and not whatever you could get out of these guys. There, there may be a minority of providers that will have to like go bankrupt or just be totally restructured, right? But like if, you know, there are a lot of places in the U.S. that, that, are, that are not run in this way and not run in this, you know, just like uh, casino type fashion where you're just trying to like suck the as maximum amount of money of, uh, as possible out of every patient. And then in other countries, you know, like the whole system works like that. Uh, it ought to be possible, whether it's through restructuring or the government just taking these, these institutions over temporarily or permanently. Right. So I guess I'm, tr- I guess I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Are you saying <laughs> that, <laughs> Here's a que- here's a question for you. We we I think all agree that single payer is is the best way forward for health insurance. Um, but when it comes to so hospitals, do you think deprivatization is a good idea? Do you think with big pharma, it's a good idea to to nationalize that? Like what 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 ways do you think it could um, help us to go beyond just dealing with the the insurers? Yeah, I think that's so. But yeah, I mean, those are interesting questions. I mean, I guess just to respond to, to you, Ryan, I think I, I guess I would respond that like all of that kind of behavior is just not going to be it's going to be illegal under single payer. Right. So it it's over. Yeah. yeah, that game is over to the extent that there's providers that are, you know, making overall providers are, are, are to the extent that there are providers that are sort of making bank off of like chasing after poor uninsured people and like taking in the bankruptcy court, um, you know. They that 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 that's a, that's done right. And the reason why I push back on, you know, sort of with John Walker's arguments and that kind of thing is that I absolutely agree that these behaviors should be illegal. But the reality is, is that it is not. It's not like hospital administrators in the United States are like genetically meaner people than hospital administrators <laughs> in Canada, right? Like hospital administrators exist in all these countries and they act very differently. So why is it? Is it this that like U.S. Hospital administrators just have a mean streak? No, it's because U.S. hospitals have evolved into profit-oriented businesses, and this is how business is done, and they're allowed to, and this is the way we finance hospitals by a combination right, right. of billing provider, billing patients, chasing after patients, pay, getting insurers. I don't like it. I hate it. It's not what we want. Let's we'll get rid of it. But that, <laughs> but but that's that's like how you change it, and just right. That, but, that's but what I, I don't get what they're talking about when they're like. Yeah. Why do you people keep talking about insurance companies? The problem is providers. My head wants to explode. So what about this? What about this, Adam? So so I've gone to uh, – Sorry, I don't many people. To... No, no, no. It makes sense to me. I, you know, I, it's totally the wrong focus. But for example and, – and I'm just trying to push for more leftist stuff here. But uh, I've I've gone to you know research institutions, universities for my care and I've gone to private uh, you know providers and I've had several instances where – uh, I went to, to a private provider for something, and as soon as he figured out I didn't have cancer or there was nothing he could do surgery on, he like wanted me out of there. And I said, well, can I at least get a diagnosis for what I have? And he said something in Latin, and I looked him straight in the eye, and I said, is that just the Latin term for my symptom? And he's like, yep. <laughs> and like he didn't give a shit because it was, you know, there was nothing serious, and I can't do anything for you because I just want to, you know, do surgery on you. And I had another instance, and so that was private. And then even within a research university's medical care, uh, I had an appointment with somebody, and they they mixed things up. And for like five minutes, I was with a surgeon instead of with the allergist that I wanted to see. And it's like, yep, we can fix that allergy right up. We're gonna we're gonna do surgery next week, and we're gonna like get into your nose and do all this stuff. I'm like, really? I don't think that's really necessary. And then the actual person I was supposed to meet came in and she she's she kicked him out and she talked to me about what he said and I told her he's like, Oh yeah, you don't need surgery. That's crazy. <laughs> right? And so like these market incentives I think are operating um in ways that aren't illegal, but but are still things that that are deleterious to to care, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean look, absolutely. And I think we I think it is an interesting discussion, uh, you know. Beyond single payer, you know, like what, like, like what do we want to change beyond just who's paying the bill, right? Right, right, um, right, right. And I think that, you know, yeah, there are certain, there are, 
benefits to public delivery models too, right? I mean, if you look at the Veterans uh, Affairs, the VH, Veterans Health Administration, um, they do a lot of things quite good. Despite all the bad press, which is very political oftentimes, um, mm-hmm. the Veterans um, Hospitals, uh, you know, by several studies, actually deliver a higher quality of care or at least as good as the private sector. Um Racial inequalities are actually lower in the VA than they are in the overall society, um, and they achieve lower drug prices. So there are there are interesting things to to, to think about with that kind of model. Um, but what I will say is that um, I think that what we talk about as single payer and what's even in, for instance, what's certainly PNHP's proposal. Like just to talk about that a little bit. It, in many ways, it goes beyond simply just a public financing model. Um, and what do I mean by that? So first off, you know, in our opinion, basically all the providers at institutions, so hospitals, health systems, you know, dialysis company, it, they wouldn't be companies, but but uh, organizations and so forth would be salaried. Uh, you, you know, so I think that's 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 a good model that inst- that provide that doctors and other healthcare providers who work at institutional providers would be salaried. Um, and that's that's an example of a sort of reform within within a single payer mm-hmm. model. But we also go well beyond that. I mean, we don't believe that for profit companies should actually be allowed to take part in the system. And in fact, we would use public money to buy out the shareholders of for profit companies like the dialysis chains or for profit hospitals to be able to bring their facilities um, into the into the public system. Um, and finally, what, what is in these bills, which is really critically important, and it doesn't get a lot of attention, perhaps because it's so nerdy, um, is the the, the the Jayapal bill, for instance, would actually not allow, would, would give hospitals a global budget, meaning they would get a set amount of money to take care of all the patients over the course of the year, um, similar to, you know, the VA, um, that global budget, they couldn't retain any of it as profits. They couldn't profit mm. what was left over. They couldn't mm. use it um, for certain things. Um, and then um, eff- effectively, um, you know, the, the, the public monies would be used to, be, to for so, you know, so-called capital expansion. So for new projects, for new hospitals, for new wings, for big new equipment, that would actually be funded separately, not from hospitals mm-hmm. operating mm-hmm. margins. That would be funded separately. And that would help, first of all, to sort of, um, reduce waste because you know you probably see these like giant towers that go up that hospitals build to attract more patients and you wonder like is it really about need or is it more about you know what's lucrative um, but it would also help reduce um, health care inequalities in our society which are rising mm-hmm. hospitals close where profits are low you saw this with Hanneman Hospital in Philadelphia recently you see this with all these rural hospitals that are closing um, and so at the same time that big, fancy, shiny new sports complexes at hospitals are being built, other places hospitals are shrinking. So to really to mm. really fix that, we need to talk about hospital capital financing and how to actually use public money to determine where we you know where new hospitals go. And, and that's that, that's the House bill you're talking about, right? So does Ber- does Bernie's Senate bill not do that, or, or, or are there good things in each bill that you would combine, or how do you differentiate those those two? Um, I think that um, <clears throat> what Bernie's bill, when Bernie's bill came out, one thing it did much better was that it, it covered. Um, uh, reproductive health care, including abortion. Um, both bills have been aligned in that area. So I, I do think that the House bill has a couple of significant advantages uh, over the Bernie bill, um, right, specifically right. the hospital global budgets, um, the, the explicit fu- um, um, fund, the explicit uh, capital financing. Um, and I think that the um, so, so I think there are some tweaks that I'd like I, I would love to see made in, in Bernie's bill. Is, is is there any other single payer bill like does Elizabeth Warren simply co-sign on Bernie's bill or is she offering? OK, so yeah. she doesn't she's not offering a, a different uh, proposal. OK, one Senate bill, one House bill. Got it. Yep. Cool. Cool. Well, um, that's probably a good place to leave it off right there. I know you got to take off soon. Yeah. Any last but, um, uh, any last thoughts that you want to offer before before you go? No, this was a. I think this was a really great discussion, and I hope I didn't, um, you know, bore listeners too much with. Um, once I start talking about <laughs> hospital capital, I think people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> we like the nitty gritty. Very here. important. <laughs> But uh, it was really great. It was a really great conversation. So I, I thank you two for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on.
Thanks, Adam. We hope to have you on again, and, and thanks for the good work you do. Alan, thank you both, yeah. too, and let, let's, let's keep in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely.